Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we'll be looking at the critical appraisal of a systematic review and a meta-analysis. Um, so let's just look at this figure. Uh, this uh, shows us the hierarchy of evidence. Um, so to look at therapy and harm, we usually look at uh, randomized, randomized control trials or observational studies mm -hmm. and uh, unsystematic observational studies. Um, um, and um, in the hierarchy of evidence, we see that um, pre-appraised research, that is synopsis, systematic reviews, all of that comes quite higher up in the evidence pyramid. And uh, summaries and guidelines come right on the top. And non-pre-appraised research, uh, individual independent observational studies and independent randomized control trials forms the base for this. Uh, so whenever we look for a particular, um, for an answer for a particular clinical question, we always go to the best evidence that's available, either a summary or a guideline or a review article. It summarizes a lot of uh, evidence and which gives us the information to us. And the next best thing is to look at um, pre-appraised research, which is synopsis and systematic reviews. This is just for us to um, just for us to see that, to highlight the point that systematic reviews comes uh, relatively higher up in the evidence pyramid. So now um, just let's just look at what a systematic review is and what a meta-analysis is. Uh, systematic review is the method by which we look for research that addresses a focused clinical question. So uh, it's a summary of research that addresses a focal, focused clinical question in a systematic and a reproducible manner. So the methodology and the rigor by which we look for uh, selecting studies which have been done, which look at this particular focused clinical question is a systematic review. And a meta-analysis is a statistical analysis of an aggregation of all these results from different uh, studies. So the statistical pooling or aggregation of results from different studies gives us the meta-analysis. Um, so here, um, a systematic review usually includes a meta-analysis within it. Um, so a systematic review may not always have a meta-analysis and a meta-analysis may not always have a systematic review. If we just have a mathematical uh, pooled estimate, then that is a meta-analysis. But if it is done by way of a systematic review in terms of its methodology, then we call it a systematic review along with the meta-analysis. So now let's look at our clinical question. So we have a 62 year old gentleman. He's a diabetic and he has coronary artery disease with LV ejection fraction of 35%. Uh, he's currently admitted for a congestive heart failure. Uh, he's been medically managed with diuretics with uh, appropriate doses of ACE inhibitors, pyranolactone, beta blocker, aspirin and atorvastatin. His diabetes is well controlled with HbA1c of 6 he doesn't have any kidney disease. His creat is 0.98 with an EGFR of 60, uh, and there is no proteinuria. So here the sisters have noted, the nurses working in this ward are, have noted that uh, similar patients similar to him are on this extra drug, uh, which is an SGLT2 inhibitor, like a dapagliflozin or an empagliflozin. And they are wondering whether this should also be added for this patient and whether there is a role for SGLT2 inhibitors in this patient. So to answer this question, um, let's look at this study, which is a systematic review and meta-analysis published in the Lancet. Uh, this is SGLT2 inhibitors for primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular and renal outcomes in type 2 diabetics. Um, so when we, when we want to critically appraise a systematic review or a meta-analysis, we usually do it under these two major headings, which is assessing the credibility of the process and rating the confidence in the estimates. And then we see how this can be applied to our patient. So the PICO question is that uh, the, the population that was included was RCTs of patients with type 2 diabetes, and uh, they intervened with an SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, and the control that was given was standard patient care in terms of uh, managing them, and they looked for uh, the adverse events of, uh, they looked for major adverse cardiovascular events, a composite of cardiovascular death or a hospitalization for heart failure and uh, the progression of renal disease. We look at what major adverse cardiovascular events are in the coming slides. Now let's move on to the first step, which is assessing the credibility of the systematic review process. <clears throat> so the first question here is, did the review explicitly address a sensible clinical question? Yes, they did. Does the addition of an SGLT2 inhibitor to standard care decrease the incidence of major adverse cardiovascular events? That is a death due to a cardiovascular event or a stroke 
or a uh, myocardial infarction or uh, cardiovascular death or hospitalized heart failure uh, hospitalization due to heart failure and progression in renal disease in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus so the population and the intervention and the outcome that they are looking for are all well defined here so uh, these were the criteria for considering studies they looked at all studies which were randomized and placebo controlled cardiovascular outcome trials which is because we are looking at a therapy and this is the best study designed for this and uh, uh, all studies which were published up till september 24 2018 and uh, where follow up was complete were included and they looked at adults with type 2 diabetes and uh, all the trials which included sglt2 inhibitors as its intervention and uh, again as mentioned earlier they looked for uh, mace a uh, composite of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure and progression of renal disease so uh, the next question is was the search for relevant studies exhaustive uh, no the search was actually not exhaustive so here the authors have mentioned that they have searched in uh, pubmed and in embase but other major sources like the cochrane central register for control trials the nursing and allied health uh, registry for clinical trials uh, other national and uh, who clinical trial registries and conference proceedings all of these things were not searched which means that some trials which may not have published or some trials which may have been done and uh, which showed different results may have not are not included in this meta analysis uh, so this is the prisma flow diagram for study selection So there were totally one hundred and seventy-five citations which were identified first from PubMed and MBS, and uh, after clearing out from duplicates, they had screened one hundred and fifty-six abstracts, and uh, subsequently uh, they had excluded one hundred and forty-seven of them because they did not fit the the outcomes of interest or the population that they were interested in, and three unique trials were included in the uh, analysis. and contributory secondary analysis was done with uh, six trials um so when we look at each of the individual trials um uh, we'll have to assess each of their risk of bias so all these trials would a full paper would have been screened and uh, they looked at the risk of bias for each of these and this was assessed using the cochrane tool for assessing risk of bias in randomized clinical trials so all these independent variables like random sequence generation allocation concealment blinding of each of the uh, people participants the healthcare providers the outcome assessors um and uh, 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 and the reporting all of this was looked at and they found that the overall risk of bias among all three trials were was very low so all these three trials were very well done trials and uh, did the review address possible explanations for between study differences in results so only three trials were included and when we look at the results we will see that all these three trials kind of said the same thing so the results were consistent between the three different trials so the authors did not comment on any possible explanations for study differences looking at the baseline characteristics the empareg outcome trial the canvas program trial and the declare timi trial were the three major trials which were included so here we see that they are all large trials so there was 7000 people that were recruited in the empar trial 10000 in the canvas trial and 17000 in the declare timi trial and they looked at the drugs which were empagliflozin canagliflozin and dapagliflozin the doses given here we see that majority of were men so there were 28% 35% and 37% of women in these trials and the mean age was 63 similar to our uh, gentleman who is uh, whom we had seen whom we are trying to answer this question for and uh, we see that about 10% 14% and 10% of people had a history of heart failure and uh, almost all of them in empagliflozin in ev all of them in empagliflozin had an established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease Sixty-five uh, percent and forty percent had uh, established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in the canvas and the declared TME trials. So the baseline characteristics seem to suit the patient who is at hand uh, well. Uh, did the review present results that are ready for clinical application? So normally we find that uh, clinicians, uh, as clinicians, um, when so something is expressed to us in the form of a hazard ratio, we cannot immediately translate it into what its its clinical meaning in our minds. However, it's it's easier if we are told uh, results as an absolute risk reduction or a number needed to treat. 
that is if we if the number needed to treat for example was 10 we can uh, we can interpret that as if 10 people were treated we could save one major adverse cardiovascular event or one um, uh, cardiovascular related death or a hospitalization for heart failure um, that is easier for us to understand and it's easier for us to explain to the patients as well and they are able to understand it similarly with absolute risk reduction when some when an intervention brings down an outcome from 20 percent to 10 percent then we know that there's an absolute risk reduction of 10 percent that's again easier to explain to the patient uh, but however this was not done and the results were presented only as hazard ratios um, at the end of this meta-analysis. Another important thing is that they did not give us a summary of findings table. They had just given us independent results tables. Uh, was the selection and assessment of studies reproducible? Uh, two reviewers selected studies independently and they extracted data independently. And the discrepancies were resolved by consensus. There was no third party that uh, resolved the differences. The next part of the uh, uh, appraisal is rating confidence in the estimates, looking at the quality of evidence. So this is usually done uh, by the grade approach where we rate the quality of evidence uh, and the confidence in the estimates. Um, and the rating, initial rating of confidence is higher for um, interventional studies or randomized trials and it's lower for observational studies. And the confidence rating goes up if the effect size is very large. That is, if it is clearly showing an, uh, uh, an effect which is favoring treatment. Uh, and the confidence rating goes down when any of these risk of bias, inconsistency, indirectness, imprecision, or if there is a publication bias which is present. A similar grade approach is also done for uh, risk of bias. And then uh, the, quali the uh, quality of evidence and the, or the confidence in the estimates is rated as low, moderate, or high. Um, so here the grade approach was not used, so they did not uh, in uh, they did not assess the risk of bias in the body of the evidence, or the or they did not rate the confidence in the effect estimates. There is no mention of it. Um, are the results consistent across the studies? Um, there is a, there's two ways of going about this. One is we can visually assess the results for variability, and we can say. Uh, whether it is um, consistent across the studies or not. And there are other statistical tests. So now let's look at this example figure. So here uh, we see that uh, these dots, these are the point estimates. The effect estimates are, the, are of each individual independent randomized control trial. And these lines which are going through it show us the confidence interval. Um, so here we look at four trials. We see that two of these trials favor treatment very well. And two of these trials do not favor treatment. And here, both the confidence intervals are not crossing the line of no difference because each of them are precisely saying that. And here, if you pool all these four trials, you get this effect estimate, which is again favoring treatment. And the, the confidence interval is not crossing the line of no difference. But here we see that two, two trials are saying something and two trials are saying something completely different. So how do we believe these? <coughs> so we can eyeball it and say, <laughs> that these four trials are very heterogeneous. Similarly, if we, we can eyeball this and say that all these four studies are saying the same thing, that they are all favoring treatment, and all of these are also crossing the line of no difference. <laughs> all of these are also crossing the line of no difference. And um, so they are somewhat similar to each other. Uh, similarly, we see that in the third study, some are crossing the line of no difference and so, uh, sorry, some favor and some do not favor, but all the confidence intervals are crossing the line of no difference. So it can either be this or that. And the pooled estimate is showing us that there is no difference. So here in the first one, the heterogeneity is very high. The second one, the heterogeneity is low. And in the third one also, the heterogeneity is low. So now the statistical tests which are done for this is this calculating this I square or heterogeneity um, index. So this again is consistent. So here we see it's 95% and the, and the other two it's 0% and 6%. Uh, another way of doing it is by doing a yes or no statistical test. And we can get a P value for this, which tells us if these differences are by chance or not. Uh, so if these differences are by uh, uh, chance, then the p-value will be more than 0 
but if it is not by chance, it will be less than 0.05. So here we see that the p-value is less than is 0. Point, less than 0 0.001. That means these differences are not by chance, and they are actually because of a particular reason. Maybe these studies were done. Uh, maybe these studies are not favoring the treatment because maybe they gave a lesser dose, or maybe there was some other problem in the methodology of the study or some other problem in these centers which made these become like this so there is a reason for this uh, but however you see that these study differences are uh, by chance because the p-value is greater than 0 0.05 and similarly here also the p-value is 0 0.36 so these study differences are actually by chance and they are somewhat similar to each other so that's what uh, 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 these are saying the I square statistic uh, we can usually interpret as 0% as no heterogeneity and 100% as completely different studies. So there is no point in pooling uh, such studies together and getting a pooled estimate because they are so heterogeneous. Uh, usually we say that 25% we are only a little concerned and below that the heterogeneity is reasonably okay and above that the heterogeneity is higher. Um, um, so this is just something that we should keep in mind. However, for a study where the heterogeneity is very low, again, the generalizability becomes a problem and we cannot extrapolate it to a, um, to a to a heterogeneous population. Now let's look at the results. Um, these are the uh, results for uh, the pooled data for composite of myocardial infarctions, stroke and cardiovascular death. So here we see that all three trials are favoring treatment. And the point estimate is also showing a hazard ratio of 0 0.89, the confidence interval between 0 0.83 to 0 0.96. Here again, they have stratified this, stratified this based on <coughs> atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and uh, as a risk factor and patients with other multiple risk factors. So here it's showing that the patients who have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease seem to be benefiting more from the use of SGLT2 inhibitors. Similarly, this is an unstratified analysis for cardiovascular death and, ho and hospitalization due to heart failure. Again, giving us a pooled estimate of 0 0.77, 0 point confidence interval between 0 0.71 to 0 0.84, favoring treatment. And the stratified results also again show that those with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease seem to be benefiting more. Uh, this, this is seen again in hospitalization uh, for heart failure and cardiovascular death stratified by history of heart failure, similar to our patient. Those with history of heart failure seem to be benefiting, and even those who don't have history of heart failure seem to be benefiting at the end of the pooled estimate, because all the pooled estimate confidence intervals are not crossing the line of no difference. This is the pooled data for the composite of worsening of renal function and end-stage renal disease or renal death. This again is showing that this is favoring treatment with a hazard ratio of 0 0.55 uh, with a confidence interval of 0 0.48 to 0 0.64. Uh, again, stratified by atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, uh, disease, whether it is with or without, both show, um, uh, both favor treatment. Now let's look at how precise these results are. Uh, when we look at the hazard, major adverse cardiovascular event, without atherosclerotic risk, the hazard ratio is 0 0.89. Um, so we can get the, the control event rate from the previous table as uh, 24 per 1,000 patient years. And the um, intervention or the experiment event rate as 21 per 1,000 patient years, which is what is given to us. Uh, we can uh, calculate the, um, uh, the absolute risk reduction as three fewer per thousand patient years. And uh, this estimate of five fewer to one fewer, we can get from the least confidence interval to the greatest confidence interval. So it, there can be anywhere from uh, a 17% protection to a 4% protection. So we just multiply 0 0.83 into the control event rate to get five and 0 0.96 to the control event rate to get one. This is how we have got these confidence intervals. Uh, so again, all these seem to be favoring the intervention. Similarly, for cardiovascular death and heart failure with uh, requiring hospitalization, we see that there are four fewer per 1,000 patient years. So and uh, anywhere between five fewer to one fewer and three per 1,000 patient years for renal worsening and anywhere between three fewer to four fewer. This means that if we treat... Um, thousand patients per year, we can decrease four cardiovascular deaths 
or uh, uh, heart failure requiring hospitalization. Uh, so in our patient, who's a 62 year old gentleman with a di who's a diabetic and who's been optimally managed with every other medicine, our question is whether there is a role for SGLT2 inhibitors. Now let's uh, uh, look, see whether these results apply to our patient. Yes, it does. Very similar. Um, our patient is very similar. He's diabetic, has atherosclerotic risk factors. It's currently being managed for uh, heart failure. Um, so there is a potential reduction in this individual for major adverse cardiovascular events, the potential reduction in cardiovascular death and heart failure admissions, and a potential reduction in possible renal worsening. Um, so is there a concern about reporting bias? Yes. Usually um, all the trials which are included are visualized as a, as a funnel plot. Um, so let's look at this. So here we see that all the uh, the precision of the effect estimates is given uh, on the y-axis and the magnitude of the effect size is given on the x-axis. So always smaller trials will have a larger magnitude and larger trials will have a, will show a smaller effect. Uh, so we see that, uh, so it will always look like a funnel this way. And uh, if, if it is favoring treatment, then it will be on one side. And if it is not favoring treatment, it will be on the other side. Uh, so usually uh, whenever a funnel plot is placed, this will be symmetric. But if uh, it's asymmetric, like it is seen in this figure where there's a hole here, uh, it shows that more trials which are favor control are there, but they have not been reported or they have not been published. Uh, and this is not captured in this meta-analysis. So the way to overcome this is one is something called trim and fill, where we can compute data and, uh, and uh, include this um, and see whether, uh, uh, whether it works out. Or uh, this is a way in which we uh, in which we say that there ha may have been a publication bias. Um, another way to look at it is actually to go back and uh, see whether we can uh, collect data from clinical trial registries and look for unpublished data from conference proceedings, etc. The best way to overcome this publication bias is to prospectively do a meta-analysis. That is, you pre-announce that you're going to do a meta-analysis and you already announce and include all the trials which are ongoing from various cl clinical trial registries. And then you ask them to disclose the results with you once the trial is completed. So there is no specific reason for us to increase our confidence because the effect is not large, very marginal effect that we have seen. Um, so now let's look at the cost. Empagliflozin and dapagliflozin are available in our pharmacy. It uh, costs about 1,000 up till 1,740 per patient per month for empagliflozin. And for dapagliflozin, it costs about 450 for, per patient per month. So for about uh, one year, this costs about 5,400 per patient. And if we were to tra treat 1,000 patients for a year, then this would go on to um, something like uh, uh, thousand, something like 54, 54 uh, lakh rupees if we were to treat 1,000 uh, patients per year. So uh, that's how much it costs to decrease uh, major adverse cardio uh, that so the we can we see that the major adverse cardiovascular events are brought down by uh, about three fewer per thousand patient years so if you spend 54 lakhs on a patient then you you can decrease it by three you can decrease uh, major adverse cardiovascular events by three um, so in summary there are some concerns in the methodology the search was not extensive uh, there may have been pos possible reporting bias and the authors did not comment on their confidence in the effect estimate. And overall, there seems to be a marginal benefit. Another thing is uh, there are see, some adverse events for the use of SGLT2 inhibitors, like increased risk of mycotic genitourinary infections, some increased risk of amputations, which again were not pooled and studied. Um, uh, that's not been, it's not been presented in this meta-analysis. For our patient, we will look at the cost and benefit. So there's a very marginal benefit. So if the patient is able to afford this treatment, then it may be given to them. Uh, but in on a large scale, looking at the costs and benefits, again, we'll have to independently discuss it for every patient. That's what we would conclude at the end of this um, uh, methodology, at the end of this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. That brings us to the end of this presentation.